The Unshackled Waves, episode 218. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, as you know, on this show, we like to promote many of the upcoming Australian tours by prominent international speakers. One of them who is coming to our shores next month is Dr. Stephen Hicks. He is a Canadian-American philosopher who teaches at Rockford University in Illinois, as well as having visiting positions at Oxford University in England and Kashmir, the great university in Poland, and has lectured at universities across the globe. His areas of academic expertise are critiques of postmodernism and the return of Marxism. He is also a great defender of capitalism and free speech. His two most well-known publications are Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism, and Nietzsche and the Nazis. And we are lucky today to have an advanced chat with Dr. Hicks before he arrives in Australia to learn a bit more about his ideas. Dr. Hicks, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Tim. Appreciate your invitation. Now, obviously, your area of expertise is postmodernism in political science. And uh, basically, your summary of it is that it's a new way of framing political debates outside of traditional realism and liberalism or how we would know it. And it tries to create a new set of rules for, for discourse. Can you elaborate on that? Well, sure. Yeah, my... Uh... My argument is that uh, politics is a manifestation of some underlying philosophy, that there has been a sea change uh, among a vigorous segment of our intellectuals, and that the first generation of people we call post-modernists, people like Richard Rorty, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and the others, all of them were PhDs in philosophy. And they got first-rate education at very good universities about the state of knowledge, uh, epistemology, language, cognition, and so forth. And they're of a generation that reached some very skeptical conclusions about our capacity for achieving truth, knowledge, certainty, or anything like that. So uh, the political manifestation of that then is if you become skeptical and you don't think that there is such a thing as a, a truth or you redefine truth to say it's just subjective groups or subjective individuals who, who have their own truths, then the rules of politics are going to change quite significantly. Now, the big contrast here is if you think of the modern world, the things that most of us uh, take pride of if we think the modern world has made great progress, well, we believe things like there are universal rights to you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property rights, equal treatment, and so on. And, and those are very uh, uh, strong claims. So we make the claims to say these apply to all human beings in principle and that they should be uh, absolutes or they should be treated as objectively known principles. Uh, and on the basis of that, then we... Uh, you know, we, we fight against those who want to have double standards for aristocrats, we, so we extend rights to, to all human beings, uh, to, to women, we free slaves, we argue that people should not be treated on racial grounds and so on. So it's this very ambitious, morally strong, universalistic project that uh, is a large part of the modern world. But what happens then if you say, oh, you know, there are no universal principles. Uh, we don't really know big truths like, you know, all human beings should be this, that, or the other thing, that we're all trapped in our subjective groups or that instead of being able to think for ourselves, we're shaped by group identities. Politics has to go in a very different direction. And that's a significant portion of what postmoderns are doing. So it's moving from objective truths and reality to the the subjective that there's there's nothing that's correct or universal it's it's all in the interpretation of depending on who the individual is yeah so a lot of times you'll see in the text you know the, the words like truth and certainty and rights are put in quotation marks you know, that that distancing or ironic 
uh, sensing. They, we don't really believe in those things anymore. Now, obviously, where we've seen postmodernist thought manifest itself, the greatest is in the university system, where 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 you're yes. based, where. Uh, this is where identity politics has it has the the greatest influence and in the spread throughout our society because if you uh, teach or the students uh, are taught these days that there are these objective universal truths then uh, that's considered insulting or demeaning to their individual subjective experience and it's been a good excuse to uh, shut down debate or reframe uh, political uh, debate, and obviously you've you've got firsthand experience. You're on the on the on the ground level. So, uh, how has that come about in the the university system? Yeah, I think uh, there there are two wings that uh, emerge out of this. One is a more cynical wing, uh, where you realize that uh, you can use this idea of subjective group truths to attack any ideas that you don't think currently are advantaging your groups. So for example, if you are uh, an advocate of uh, you know, a racial group or an ethnic group that's not doing very well in science, say, uh, and then rather than saying to the, the individuals in those group, well, you need to get your act together and do better at science because everybody needs to know something about science, what you can do is to say, well, uh, what I'm actually interested in is just getting my group's members, uh, more of them to have university degrees so that they can get positions of social standing. And what I want really is a, a kind of affirmative action in science grading that they're not doing very well, but they have to take these science courses. So uh, what we should do is uh, grade them at a different standard. And so you're introducing a, a double standard at that point. Uh, and it's very hard, of course, for people trained uh, in a modern universalistic way of thinking about things to say no, uh, to, to countenance double standards. So what you can then do is to say, well, the reason why we are making everybody do science is that, uh, say, European people of, an or, uh, of, of European ancestry or whites or males who uh, are traditionally doing very well in sciences and came up with it, it's their way of thinking and they have just kind of forced it down the throats of everybody else and that was a great unfairness. And uh, you can do that then to put those guys on the defensive. Uh, so science then doesn't uh, have these universalistic pretenses anymore. And then people who uh, uh, are more likely to be hard in grading will say, oh, well, maybe I'm being unfair to people who aren't white or aren't of European ancestry and more likely to go along with the affirmative action in grading type of program. Now that's a, a cynical reading, but there are uh, any number of people in higher education and, 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 and broadly speaking who, uh, who will go that route. Now the other route though is uh, a more of a true believer where they, they really will say that uh, they believe there are different routes to knowledge uh, or that there is no such thing as knowledge that everything really is just subjective and so from their perspective they will say you know science logic mathematics those don't have any better standing cognitively than intuition or feeling or various kinds of group traditions and then on the basis of that they will uh, quite i would say honestly in their own thinking then say we should uh, lessen the scientific curriculum, not require certain groups of people to uh, to have a general, well-rounded education along traditional modernist liberal lines. And so uh, you have a debate then between those who say, no, in fact, science and math and logic are universal and everybody needs to know them and those who want to get out of it on uh, on subjectivist group grounds. Is it fair to say that this has begun in the the universities because that is obviously is where philosophy is formed and its success is due to basically how well the postmodernists have been able to to reframe the debate of uh, political discourse and you've also talked about how university administrators they're not really adherents to it but they just mm. don't want to uh, 
disrupt the, the, the money flow, the money coming in from government, uh, have a bad uh, reputation. They uh, And the fact that these people and their adherents are so aggressive, there's all those videos mm -hmm. on YouTube of students screeching at university administrators right. saying, uh, how dare you, that it, it, it's just easier for them to just tolerate them and enable them to just let things run how they consider smoothly. Right. Yeah, we should expect the uh, most extreme manifestations to happen first in universities because we do, in a way, set universities up as a laboratory for ideas. And we encourage people to have extreme, original, bizarre ideas and, and to play them out. Uh, and then when uh, a certain set of bizarre ideas uh, gain some traction, we are going to see some some strange results. So in a way, it's an intended consequence of what we want universities to uh, to do. Uh, and I do think you're right in pointing out it does start among the professoriate, among the intellectuals. Uh, and, and a lot of the arguments that have the, the most traction are philosophy type arguments. And so the, the way philosophy was being done two generations ago, we're now seeing that very widespread in uh, some universities and spilling out. But yes, universities are not only uh, what the professors do. Uh, we now have well-trained students. Uh, and so the students, it's interesting that a lot of the postmodern speech codes uh, uh, and, and forms of censorship used to be directed at students. But one of the interesting things in the last generation is that the students are now learning that they can take those same speech codes and the same arguments for it and start to use them against their professors. <laughs> so uh, we now have a, a two-way battle sometimes that goes on there. But then also there are the, uh, the administrators, and I think administrators crudely should be divided into two broad categories. I'm speaking mostly about North American universities, the ones I know best. There's the whole student services wing and they look after student life, uh, organizing events and sometimes guest speakers and entertainment programs and looking after residence life and so on. And in many uh, institutions, uh, uh, those have been co-opted by various forms of postmodernism as well or applied postmodernism. So you see some of the worst indoctrination and uh, political correctness in the bad sense manifested there. Those tend to be uh, more true believer types. You also mentioned administrators uh, uh, who don't uh, uh, function in the student services part of the university. Rather, they are deans and provosts and uh, development officers who are charged with raising money and the president and, and, uh, and so forth. And here, uh, I don't want to speak with too broad a brush, but uh, standardly, if you are in charge or the president of a university now, the priority of job functions for you are first, uh, fundraising, uh, second, administrative efficiency, keeping the organization going, and then third, being a figurehead, and perhaps fourth, having some sort of educational mission that one uh, is uh, advocating for. Uh, but the way it typically goes, since university presidents are so busy, is that uh, those get treated in that order. And so anything that's going to be a threat to their ability to raise funds, uh, anything that causes problems and dissent within the university uh, and, and leads to uh, I I administrative inefficiencies, those are the things that they will be most attentive to. And it's, a, it's a, I think, a natural, I don't want to say it's quite bureaucratic, although sometimes it is, because that, that can be a pejorative, is just to uh, to want any problems that arise just to go away. And rather than doing uh, the, the difficult thing of saying, we have some dirty laundry and let's air the dirty laundry, or here we have a difficult case and let's be very careful that we are engaged in due process and being fair and just to everyone, that what you want is uh, for that problem to be swept under the carpet, not to get the bad publicity, uh, not to have to exert uh, a great deal of effort and expense to solve the problem fairly. And so uh, to a large extent, that enables uh, you know, pathological manifestations of political correctness to, to get a, a lot more traction. Uh, they, uh, they, they get their way and uh, then they get their way a little bit more the next time. And there's a passivity on the part of the administration that uh, enables 
uh, those those pathological uh, manifestations to grow. It reminds me how it's manifested in other forms in society. For uh, for example, uh, conservative talk show hosts, there's there's always threats to boycott advertisers on that program and corporations these days because they just don't want to deal with the the barrage of uh, one star reviews they'll get on right. social media just just cave in. Sure. Oh yes, absolutely. So uh, yeah, if you're going to take on controversial issues, uh, difficult issues, and you're going to be a principled person, there are all sorts of uh, social forces that can make your life miserable, uh, including going after your your advertisers and your and your pocketbook. So, uh, you know, I in fact don't have any problem with people voting with their pocketbook and people trying for boycotts and so forth because that then is a a peaceful way of expressing your your displeasure. Uh, I do think it becomes different when we start talking about state institutions because state institutions have the power of the police and the military behind them and uh, that that's uh, that's a different can of worms. Sure. Now, the university phenomena, which most people are familiar with, is that of uh, trigger warnings on controversial content and the idea of microaggressions that you subliminally said something that's offensive yes. to identity yes. group. And there's also safe spaces where you're protected from other groups and ideas. And I really liked uh, your article explore, exploring the philosophy behind uh, this phenomena, yeah. that it's turning Thanks. weakness or what a person who says they're in a position of weakness into a position of power and using that against the, the strong to basically flip the powers of arguments on its head. Yes, yes. The uh, it is in many cases a disingenuous power play. Uh, if you think of uh, you know we all have struggles and difficulties and sometimes we fall down and we fail. Uh, but if you're a person of some self-respect, what you will typically do is pick yourself up. You will deal with your own problems, and you don't flaunt and display your failures uh, and expect other people to to solve your problems for you. So uh, when you have a class of people or a group of people who are going out of their way to display their weaknesses, to tell you know, how hard their life is and to blame other people for their problems and try to instill guilt and shame, uh, to me it's quite obvious that that is a, a ploy right? or, or a, uh, a power play. Now, the analogy I sometimes think of here is uh, if you think of you know, economic distress, suppose you fall on very hard times and you don't have any money and it really is uh, an emergency situation and you need to ask other people for money. How do you go about doing that? Well, you do it politely, you do it civilly. And you, you should make it clear that that person is not really under any obligation to give you money, but perhaps out of a spirit of benevolence, they will give you some money. And you're perhaps incurring an, an obligation on your part to repay that in some way that you, uh, as fast as you possibly can. You may even be reduced to the status of being a, a, a beggar or a panhandler in the street. If your situation is very, very, uh, very desperate, but there's a difference between a person who will, uh, if absolutely necessary, ask other people on the street for money, versus the strategy of some people who are on the streets who will be more confrontational. And if uh, you're walking by, and they start uh, you know, making comments about, "Hey, you're wearing a very nice coat," or "Where did you buy that expensive cup of coffee?" Uh, what they're trying to do is make you feel ashamed for not giving them money, to guilt you into giving money. Uh, the idea then being that the person will, out of that sense of guilt, be more likely to give money. And it's a kind of low-grade extortion that's going on. Now, if you transpose that to a university campus, you know, we all uh, uh, you know, struggle and have had perhaps difficult issues in our life. But if you're uh, on a campus and what you are saying is, you know, my, 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 my emotional state and my intellectual state is so fragile that I just can't bear for certain people to say certain words in my presence or to, uh, to, to express certain opinions 
in my presence. Then normally what we would say, a healthy person would say, I, you know, I've got serious psychological problems if I can't bear to hear certain words said. And maybe what I need to do is withdraw from university, get some counseling until I'm healthy enough to take on a genuine university education. And what it seems to me is it's very clear that what you're doing is you're using your weakness, which may be genuine to some extent. There are people who have real traumas, but in that case, what you're really doing is you're saying there's certain viewpoints that I just don't want to have uh, prevalent on my university, and I'm using this as a, a strategy for shutting them up. And I think that's basically what the trigger warning strategy is. And microaggressions is another variation on that. Now, you've written about the reason why the postmodernists are winning is because we're, we're playing by a set of moral high ground rules, which they don't uh, play by. And mm. I was reminded by reading your work, but I couldn't see it uh, reference was the, the book Rules for Radicals by Sol Alinsky, which basically... Mm the philosophy of is to win, you've got to play by a different set of rules, which you have to make sure don't apply to uh, your opponents. And that and that's how you win, by making sure that your rules are more favorable uh, to your opponents. And you're exactly correct that this this is why the postmodernists are winning, because we're, we're constantly say, saying that, no, we've got to not just take the horror migraine, but we've got to make sure that we respect our opponent's rules. And, of course, that's why we're, we're always on the defensive. Mm, yes. Well, I should confess that I have not actually read uh, Rules for Radicals from start to finish, but I know it by reputation, and I've seen excerpts of it posted online. And it's uh, essentially a, a street fighter activist's uh, manual. And the idea is that you, you fight dirty when it's uh, street fighting. And particularly if your opponent is playing by not street fighting rules, wants to say, you know, there are formal rules of boxing and wrestling and, and, and they're going to abide by that. And you are using their sense of dignity and moral high ground against them. Um, so my view though, is that in a, in a university context, that's where I'm mostly arguing from, or in a civil society, when we do have hopefully police protection against actual assault, the temptation to stoop to the, the lower person's tactics is one that should be avoided. So yes, they will engage in ad hominem attacks. Don't do that. Uh, they will make stuff up, right? Well, don't resort to doing that yourself. They will present distorted statistics and so on. Uh, and that does, in the short run, uh, mean that one will uh, incur some costs. But in the long run, particularly in intellectual battles, uh, one's reputation is a, a huge asset. And if you have a reputation among younger open-minded or people who are genuinely interested in looking at both sides of an issue, if they know that you are always open to arguments, that you are always trying to present the data the way that you best understand, that will prevail in the long run. Uh, so what I will typically say is uh, if you are arguing with someone whom you know is arguing dirty and using inappropriate tactics, uh, keep in mind that your goal is not actually to convince that person or to change that person's mind. That person is already jaded and sold out and you're not going to get anywhere. So argue with that person as a, a matter of practicing yourself. How do I uh, uh, respond to certain kinds of objections and keep my cool and follow trains of thoughts and so on? But then also be aware if you are in any sort of a public forum that other people are listening and that they really are your audience. And intelligent people and open-minded people can recognize uh, when ad hominems are presented. And then you can just say, sorry, that was an ad hominem argument and explain why it was an ad hominem argument. Uh, and then uh, you'll score points with, uh, with the objective audience. Yeah, it's important to call out 
uh, how your your opponents uh, are playing, and that's something that's in, in in my uh, job as uh, reporting the news. I'm on the, the the front line of the the, the culture wars, and I see the the mainstream media lying, misrepresenting all the time, and I find that I'm fighting fire with fire, which means not omitting facts or deliberately misreporting, but it but it means that if I'm reporting on somebody who's done something bad, I mention like their connections and that which which they do to try and discredit right. other people. But it's yeah, that's more... absolutely important that people like yourself are doing that. I do think we're at a, a cultural learning point because the the internet, as we all know, it's a cliche. It's a extraordinarily powerful medium of communication. We're into the first generation of it, uh, and that means that uh, all, all of us are getting uh, information from multiple sources, and we all need to learn how better to process that information, that we can't rely on traditional editorial sources and filtering sources to sort out the wheat from the chaff for us, that that responsibility lies with us as individuals and getting uh, millions, if not billions of people up that learning curve. It's a slow, messy process. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a, a battle every day. Now, another area that you've written a lot about is the return of socialism and, and Marxism. And I've always wondered, and are still wondering, is that have people simply forgotten the, the horrors that socialist regimes brought in the, the 20th century, or are they uh, just making excuses for that? For example, the old thing that real communism has has never been tried, the, the reason that it failed is because of evil capitalists plotting uh, against it. Uh, where do right. you fit on, fit on that? I think there's a, a generational shift there. I don't think that most young people have forgotten the lessons of history. I think they just never have learned the lessons of history. One of the things that comes out of much of uh, what we call pragmatic uh, philosophical education and postmodern education is that the world is changing so much and uh, circumstances are always uh, evolving and revolving so fast that really history doesn't teach us any lessons that every every generation or every year or every moment is, is different. There's no causality and universality across time. So from their perspective, what's the point really of teaching 50 years ago or 100 years ago? It's, uh, it's all pointless. So history education has uh, uh, been eviscerated in the last generation. And I think all the studies that I've seen about what students know about the history of socialism or the history of capitalism or the history of anything is uh, it's it's relatively abysmal. And of course, part of the problem is that history has to a significant extent also been politicized. So you get politicized versions of history uh, and politicized uh, history teachers and history professors who are now the older generation uh, often undersell or understate or ignore entirely the uh, the abysmal track record of the various kinds of socialism that have been have been tried. I think for older people, though, I hold older people up to a higher standard, mm. uh, particularly professional educators and professionally pro pro professional uh, university educators. If you are going to hold yourself out as an expert on some subject matter, to the extent that you say, yes, I'm going to take every year a new class of uh, your children and I'm going to take lots of your money, either through tuition dollars uh, directly paid or through government subsidies, and I'm going to teach them important stuff, then uh, you really should be holding yourself to a high bar of professionalism. And so this then I think speaks to what you're saying toward the end. I don't think there are any honest people who can say among educators and professors that real socialism has not been tried. That is a, a bad faith kind of denialism. You want to say, okay, uh, you know, pure communism has not been tried or pure socialism has not been tried. It's always very transparent that when you probe that person a step or two, that what they mean is they have their particular idea about the thousand things that they would do if they were the absolute dictator of a socialist economy. 
And then they say, well, here's some socialist experiment that did one or two things differently. Therefore, I can ignore entirely the experiment. And that's that's clearly a bad faith move. I think uh, also if you're going to compare apples and oranges and you want to say, well, I don't think perfect socialism has been tried, then the uh, the apples to apples comparison or apples to oranges comparison you want to make is say, well, then pure free market capitalism also has not been tried. So what you then want to do is to say, well, you know, there's been a lot of pretty close to socialism experiments that have been done and a lot of then pretty close to free market capitalism experiments that have been done. And those are the things that you're going to compare. And if you, again, are going to be a professional, you look at the data and pretty close to capitalism, uh, excuse my blunt list, kicks the ass of pretty close to socialism every single time. There's just no comparison. And if you are not front and center on that data, uh, then I think you are being dishonest. So I think the mark of an honest socialist, and there are some of them that I know, and they, what they will do is they will say things like, yes, socialism was tried a dozen major experiments in the 20th century, a few dozen minor or smaller scale experiments in the 20th century. Yes, they all failed. That's an honest socialist. But what I am trying to do is say, this is why I think they failed and to come up with better ideas so that when we try socialism again, and I might be a true believer in socialism still, we are not going to make those mistakes again. Well, that's the argument that I use as well, that pure capitalism hasn't been tried, but almost capitalism has has been a success where it's been implemented, while yes. almost socialism has had a 100% failure rate. Yes, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, so, But I think the more important thing here is that most socialists, uh, I, I have never, ever met a socialist. And I've been talking to socialists for uh, 35 plus years since I started university. And, and often I will ask them, so why, why are you a socialist? And they never say, well, it's because, you know, I, I studied economics a lot. And, you know, the, the, the case for central planning just is overwhelmingly strong in my view. Or, or I have studied political governance and, and I believe that concentrating power into the hands of a small elite is, uh, is, is always going to work. So it's never through a serious study of political science or a serious study of economics or a serious study of history. It's always uh, that they believe that socialism is moral. They have moral objections to capitalism. They understand a certain picture of socialism that sounds ideal to them. And they are so attracted to that portrayal on moral grounds that they become converts, they become committed. And then it's always after the fact that they start considering economic issues. What do I do about the historical track record? What do I do about these political governance issues and so on? We are up against uh, uh, people who are committed to very different understandings about what fairness means, what equality means, what justice means, what freedom means, compared to those of us who are on the more free market capitalist, democratic republican side of the uh, street. I find that young Marxists, they haven't actually read Marx because they're, they're constantly tripped up on what uh, Marx meant in a lot of his writings, and they also don't try mm. to understand their opponents' philosophies. They're always raging about racism and fascism and Nazism, but they don't want to explore it, uh, understand how such ideas became popular, because in their mind there's nothing ever convincing about why these ideas became uh, popular. And of course, that's the reason why they, they don't want other people to be exposed in, in case they, they are convinced. It's a double contradiction because either they're, they're evil yeah. and nobody should ever be convinced or you're scared that they will be convinced. Yes, that's right. So those of us who advocate uh, genuine liberal education, our argument is that uh, you're training young minds to be able to think for themselves, to, to make judgments about complicated matters and to, to, uh, to be able to uh, make judgments about problems that don't necessarily have a solution yet. There's not yet an answer in the book. And so what that means is you give people hard problems, you expose them to different ways of looking at the problem, and you ask them to compare and contrast competing solutions. And you don't use any professorial authoritarian methods to say to the students that you have to believe what I believe, because you genuinely want liberal-minded students in the best sense of what liberal-minded should be. 
So the young Marxists that you are uh, are, are are talking uh, about, you know, there's an, al- an analogy here to a certain kind of uh, small r religious psychology that we do know that people can become committed to a belief system and it can be a religious one it can be a political one it can uh, be in any number of fields that they have committed to it without having done the serious thinking right it was the maybe the first belief system that they were exposed to it was presented nicely in idealistic form and they really wanted to believe something and they made a a leap of faith commitment and that sort of person then does become a kind of evangel- uh, evangelist, and they won't know the, 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 the history of their own tradition. They won't know the empirical studies. They won't be interested in having to give equal time or give a serious hearing to other viewpoints uh, that are out there. So uh, that is a, a psychological problem that those those individuals have, and it's a history of political thinking, just as it's very common in the history of religious thinking as well. Now, you've written about the the modern green movement and uh, how they appear to be part of the anti-capitalist school of thought. And there's an expression we have Mm. in Australia for for our greens, which is their watermelons, uh, green on the outside, red on the inside. But there's also the, the complicating thing that a lot of people who advocate green ideas are actually people who've got really rich off of capitalism sure yes well i think a a healthy environmental philosophy if you think what that is you know uh, i think if you're just a normal human being you want to live in a world that is clean that that has uh, you know important health effects You, you want to be healthy you want your the people you care about to be healthy so anyone interested in environmental values is going to be concerned with waste disposal issues you know it doesn't uh, you know, it's not rocket science that you should wash your hands, that you should wash your clothes, keep your house clean, your neighborhood clean, and you just you just scale that out. We're also interested in uh, 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 economic long-term productivity. So we know that production requires resources, so we're concerned with what are the stock of resources and what's the rate at which we are using them compared to being innovative and discovering new resources and so forth. So environmental concern for the status of the resources that are available to us, that's that's just normal. Now, I think that the case is strong for saying that a, a liberal, scientific, market-friendly economy and more broadly, uh, enlightenment society is going to be the most environment-friendly uh, system that you can possibly have. And the, largely that's because then you're going to have, when problems arise, the kind of people who have the scientific training to think about those problems, to generate the knowledge, the engineering skills to come up with new solutions, and the entrepreneurial ability to experiment and be flexible enough to to, to deal with the thing. So the important thing on environmental values is where does the scientific, technological, uh, and entrepreneurial flexibility come from? And that is not at all coming from the left-wing side of the spectrum. Marxism has been very clunky. The various uh, you know, back-to-earth people are opposed to science. They're opposed to technology. They're typically opposed to entrepreneurism. So they are undercutting. I would say also, if you're interested in having a clean, healthy, sustainable environment, that takes uh, typically a lot of wealth. You know, building modern sewage treatment plants that takes <laughs> a lot of millions of dollars and so you need to have a wealthy society so that you can keep things clean now the empirical data are, are clear I mean, obviously you go to the prosperous parts of a, a country and they are the cleanest and the most economically sustainable it's always the poorest places that are the dirtiest and the and the unhealthiest and the same thing holds for nations uh, i would also invite people who are interested in environmental values to look at uh, and there's good data at this. You can just Google this. Where are the dirtiest places in the world? Right? The most uh, toxic garbage dumps, the dirtiest rivers, the most polluted air, and so on. And what you find is that it's always in the least free market, 
capitalist advanced nations. The, the free market capitalist nations have minor problems in those areas, but it's always places where there's a huge measure of government control. Uh, a lot of them are former socialist and communist experiments that just were disasters for the environment. So once again, the historical track record is solidly on, on behalf of what I think of as uh, good environmental thinking, and that would be encouraging uh, liberalism, encouraging entrepreneurialism, encouraging the advance of uh, science and technology. And of course, uh, capitalism, free markets, it's a system that minimizes waste. Entrepreneurs, they hate to waste resources. They're oh, always sure. looking yeah. to put them to their, their most efficient use. And so that's why over the years we've been able to develop less and less uh, pollutant uh, petrol and use less resources when making products. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to use as a case example, uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I'm just reporting journalistically, but this is from from uh, being at a conference with energy experts. Venezuela is a perfect example here. A uh, hugely oil-rich nation, and at its level of technology, most of it imported from, again, first world nations, and all of the capital and the engineering came in from first world nations. Uh, uh, to extract the oil, but often when you are drilling for oil, you get a lot of natural gas that comes up, but it's a higher technology and a higher capital investment that's required to capture the natural gas. And so what the Venezuelans were doing, since they weren't at that level of technology, was just burning off the natural gas. So again, billions of dollars worth of natural gas, and that's an efficiency, but then it's also just being burned off, which is unhealthy and uh, dangerous way to uh, to just to put the pollutants into the environment. So you want to capture the natural gas. Again, you're going to need entrepreneurs with the high tech to be able to capture the natural gas. And that's going to be both better in terms of resource efficiency and in terms of proper waste disposal efficiency. And of course, the other argument that's put against modern capitalism is it's not fair. There, there's always these talk of people in poverty who can't afford to go to the doctor and uh, get treatment. Uh, but uh, but yes. of course, we we also know from the the socialist experiments that it was there was still a a privileged class who, if they mm. uh, needed something done, they could just use connections to to get it done. Yeah. Yes. I don't at all buy into the fact that most socialists are worried about the poor. Now, here again, I make the distinction between young socialists who are 18 to 20 years old and uh, socialists, uh, anybody who's over, say, the age of 25. You know, you've got your, your university education. I think it's fine. It's an error of ignorance if you're young and you're confronted with poor people and uh, you're 18 years old. You have little understanding of where wealth creation comes from and what it's like to, uh, to to get out of poverty. But you're confronted with something that just seems bad, right? And I think if you're a natural human being, you would, you don't want people to be living in poor uh, poverty. And what you want is a solution to the problem. And what seems like a very quick and easy solution to the problem to you is, well, there's lots of people who have lots of money and there's lots of people who don't have very much money. So let's just redistribute the wealth and solve the problem. Now, that's a mistake, uh, a mistake of, of youth and that's one that I think, uh, you know, a proper economics and politics and entrepreneurship education will will disabuse people out of. But people who are older than 25 who claim, again, to be up to speed on these issues should be looking at the data. And the data, again, are very clear that all of the nations that have tried socialism have uh, either remained poor or have gone from moderate levels of prosperity to becoming very poor. The case of uh, uh, Venezuela is our contemporary example of this. And all of the nations that have tried free market capitalism in varying degrees have precisely to the degree that they have tried free market capitalism become rich. If you're not aware of the great decreases in poverty rates in the market friendly nations, you should not be talking publicly about your concern for the poor people. The data are there. So uh, anybody who has, you know, just to take a crude example, who's a 40 year old college professor who says, you know, I'm really worried about poor people in Canada or the United States or, or Australia. Uh, and I think the free market capitalism, uh, that's just ignorance. Yeah, exactly. 
And another uh, political philosophy you've explored a fair bit in your work is objectivism, which was mm. Ayn Rand's uh, political philosophy, yeah. which was an all-encompassing way of living, but it also had a great influence on on business ethics and what it means to be an entrepreneur. And of course, I during the years in politics, uh, I've uh, learned a lot about uh, objectivism. And of course, the, the main criticism of it is that it's cult-like and you've mm. been an advocate for, for not seeing it as a, as a cult and seeing it more as a set of ideas that you can, you can learn from rather than something that's strictly adhered to. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, no, uh, Ayn Rand was a brilliant genius and I think she's absolutely important uh, cultural force and uh, and philosophical force. I've learned an enormous amount from her, and yeah, a significant of what she says uh, does inform my my own thinking. My my view of her is that she is uh, you know broadly Aristotelian, in contrast to uh, Platonists who are are much more otherworldly and disinterested in in the material concerns, and uh, in contrast to the, the Sophists who are the skeptics and the relativists relativists of that era. Uh, the postmoderns are our updated sophists. So if those classical illusions mean anything, that's that's where things things stand. Uh, and yes, uh, there's an important number of issues. I think we need to uh, take Rand seriously on the places where we are the weakest culturally right now, where the the postmoderns are having the greatest effect, are in epistemology. They have very powerful skeptical arguments that people don't know how to how to address. You know, why isn't that just, you know, white male thinking or Eurocentric thinking, right? Or or uh, you're imposing your way of uh, understanding the world on other people. So those skeptical arguments give postmoderns a lot of traction and uh, uh, an objectivist or objectivist like philosophy is on the other side of that debate. And there are some powerful arguments that need to be made. The other area where we are weak is precisely on on morals, where we find it very hard, you mentioned the business sector, for example, to stand up for ourselves and proudly say, I made a million dollars and I'm really proud of myself. Our understanding of productivity, creativity, entrepreneurship, that profits are primarily made and not taken, and that moral sanction to taking your own life seriously and saying, yes, I want to live the best life I possibly can, that I'm not a social servant uh, and so on, we can learn a lot from objectivism on that score. Now, you do mention the uh, the cult-like atmosphere, and uh, I, I think uh, objectivism, like every other important intellectual movement, has struggled with that as well. So, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the Marxists. They have their cult-like elements as well. Most religions uh, have their own cult-like elements as well. And unfortunately, I think it's a little surprising that it would happen in, in uh, objectivism since it emphasizes uh, rationality and thinking yeah. independently and, and respecting people's uh, autonomy and, and, and so forth so strongly. But no, there are a significant minority of people who have been attracted to Rand's writing who do turn it into a kind of religious dogma. And so part of my own professional career uh, has been plagued by dealing exactly with those sorts of people. <laughs> Sounds like uh, much fun. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but I, it's just a, it's a part of the intellectual life. You know, the, the Freudians, the Marxists, the Montessorians, you know, the followers of uh, just about anyone. Typically, it's the first generation after the follower. I don't want to get too social psychological here, but one of the things that uh, happens when you're dealing with a genius in the first generation is you have a lot of young people who are attracted to the genius and they want to be a part of that person's social circle. But often geniuses uh, you know, exert a price of conformity and there's a natural timidity that a lot of people have when they're in the face of someone who's a genius. It's hard for you to challenge that person and to disagree with that person. So a lot of the people who are our, our fellow travelers in the first generation are willing to you know, subordinate their own ego to the to the person they're following. And then, of course, when the founder dies, they're the ones who are in a position to assume the, the mantle of the movement, but they've got the inappropriate kind of psychology for being in those leadership roles. 
That's an interesting analysis. Well, we've certainly explored a whole range of philosophical and contemporary issue on today's show. Uh, you're a busy man, Dr. Hicks. I know you've got a class to teach now, so I've appreciated you giving, giving us your time today. Okay, thanks a lot for your questions. It was a very fun discussion. Oh, I'm glad, uh, glad I was able to facilitate it. And your Adventures in Postmodernism tour is from March 9. You're visiting Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Adelaide. And unlike, Absolutely. unlike other tours, the tickets are well within everyone's budget. And it also includes a photo and getting your, your book signed at no extra charge. Nice. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for the mention. So it's excellent value. So go to truearrowevents.com to, to book your place. All right. Thanks a lot, Tim. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. I should have mentioned that Unshackled followers can get a 10% discount on tickets to Dr. Hicks's shows using the coupon code PROMO10, so even better value. Dr. Jordan Peterson has arrived in Australia with his tour well underway. The local Antifa groups are protesting his visit, labeling him an alt-right Nazi. Again, it approves that they will call anyone uh, to the right those labels. It's been good to see, though, uh, some liberal MPs attending his shows, and he has even been invited to appear on AB sees Q&A next week. I don't have any further information on the Deplorables tour at the moment, and if the visas have been approved for all three speakers to come, it's been delayed until March, so we will see how it finally comes together. Also happening next month is the Conversation About Feminism tour featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers. You may have seen the ads for it popping up in your Facebook feeds. It should prove to be a lively debate. The Unshackled is once again a sponsor of the Next Liberty Fest conference, which is being held in Perth for the first time, organised by our good friends at Liberty Works. It is on the 8th and 9th of March, and you can book your place by going to libertyfest.org.au. Remember that The Unshackled can only continue and expand with the support of you, our followers. There are plenty of ways to support us. You can pledge over at Patreon at patreon.com slash The Unshackled and directly via our PayPal link at paypal.me slash The Unshackled. Or you are, if you're wanting a way to get around those two platforms. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. And we are also pending approval for a Subscribestar account. And we are also uh, looking at accepting cryptocurrency contributions. And also we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase some right-thinking merchandise is another way to support our work. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.